Hello, good afternoon, my friends. Uh, my name is Meng. I'm the jolly good fellow of Google. And I'm jolly today because our honored guest, uh, Rick Hansen, wrote this book. Right? This book is about happiness, love, and wisdom. And it's about the neuroscience of happiness, love, and wisdom, and it's called Buddha's Brain. It's like, it's like all my favorite topics in one convenient value size packet. It's like, one, what's there not to like about this book? Right? Uh, that's why I'm happy today. Uh, Dr. Rick Hansen, he's a neuropsychologist, author, and teacher at the intersection of psychology, neurology, and contemplative practice. He co-founded the Wellspring Institute for Neuroscience and Contemplative Wisdom, and he's the author of the book called Mother Nurture, which is one of very few books that I, I am aware of, maybe the only book, that is about taking care of, about taking care of mothers. And he's also an, an authority on how the arrival of children affect moms, fathers, and marriages. And uh, Rick enjoys rock climbing, good conversations, and good books. And in his free time, he tries to save the world. So with that, let's welcome my friend, Dr. Rick Hansen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Meng. Thank you. Well, with Meng here, I'm in good company. Can you hear me OK? How's the sound? It's OK. All right, great. And if it gets bad, please let me know. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to say, first of all, that I've never been to Google before. Uh, I use your products many times a day, of course. But uh, uh, one of the great things about being able to be here is that it gives me a little thing I can use to impress my kids. And that's very important when you're a parent. Uh, as you probably know or will discover, they're 22 and 19. And so this is one of the very few things that actually you know, made them pay attention to anything I had to say. So my intent here is to go through a number of topics, uh, four in particular, and to do it fairly quickly. So my son, to put me at ease, said, don't worry, Dad. You're going to be talking to some of the smartest people on the planet. And thanks, Forrest. Uh, but I, you know, I, in a way, that's kind of good, because I do tend to zip along at a fairly breakneck pace. And so my plan is to go through these topics kind of in four sections, pause for breath at the end of each one, do some few questions or comments. And then keep going. All right? I'm going to be working a lot at the center of these three circles, Buddhism, or really contemplative practice generally. The one I'm trained the most in is Buddhism. I'm not here to push Buddhism or any ism, but it's a source of great um, insight into actually how the mind works, as well as psychology and neurology. Uh, that said, I think it's humbling and appropriate to appreciate the fact that there's really, literally, so little we actually know about the mind and the brain these days. Uh, it's a nice quote here from Ani Tenson Palmo. You know, we, no one really still knows yet what a thought actually is, even though we're going to be talking about them a fair amount. OK, so prelims out of the way. Let's get into your amazing brain. First, some basic specs. Uh, it's kind of mind-boggling for me endlessly to, to appreciate, really, how complicated the brain is. In particular, I want to focus as an overarching theme on the fundamental idea of using the mind to change the brain for the better, so that it benefits the mind and in widening ripples all beings. So to do that, we want to get, I want to get first at some basic information about the brain and about what I call self-directed neuroplasticity, the fundamental idea that mental activity sculpts neural structure, which gives us opportunities increasingly to intervene actually inside the black box of the brain. That's important because there's a fundamental problem in that the brain, through biological evolution, is highly inclined toward uh, noting and responding to negative experiences. And in particular, has a kind of deeply ingrained threat reactivity that's then increased by personal history as well as cultural and political factors that leads to what I call paper tiger paranoia. Uh, and so then last, I'm going to talk about what to do about that with self-directed neuroplasticity in terms of coming back to the natural state of the brain, which is really the optimal brain. So I thought, this is my opportunity at Google. I'm going to take a big swing and you know, hopefully uh, hit the ball. All right, so let's dive in. And one way to think about this is purely abstractly, fine. But a more powerful way to think about it is that what we're talking about is happening right here, right now, right between your ears. So here we go. Back to where we were, the technical specs of the brain. 
kind of remarkable to realize that in roughly three pounds, about five cups worth of tissue, it are about 1.1 trillion cells, 100 billion neurons, a trillion support cells. They're connected with each other in a variety of ways. A typical neuron connects with about 5,000 other neurons, making about 500 trillion synapses. Lots of information moves through the uh, brain and the nervous system. The brain moves information around like a heart moves blood around, in effect. A fair amount of, this, uh, of the interaction between neurons is just noise. Noisy networks, as you all probably know, are, very, are, the, are optimized for signal transmission. Um, but that said, out of all the noise, uh, there are so many signals going on in the brain that in the time it takes roughly to take a single breath, roughly a quadrillion messages moved around inside your head. The brain is literally the most complex object yet known to science. More complex than an exploding star, more complex even than the American economy. Right. So here's a schematic neuron. Uh, you can see the receiving end at the, at the left as you face the screen. The output end is at the right hand side. It is like a little on-off switch. Neurons are continually firing. A neuron that's not firing is a dead neuron. Uh, and basically the summation moment to moment of roughly 5,000 inputs uh, every few milliseconds determines whether the neuron will fire. Okay? Great. So I want to talk now about two critical words that are really easy to, to lose. This is probably the most intellectually dense slide I've got. Uh, I want to talk about the mind and the brain. I define the mind as the flows of information through the nervous system. The nervous system has its headquarters in the brain. Information is represented by the nervous system, much like a computer hard drive represents information, or sound waves right now are representing information, radio waves represent information. It's the classic uh, and familiar distinction between hardware and software. In essence, therefore, apart from hypothetical transcendental factors, the mind is what the brain does. No brain, no mind. All right? Now, I say the brain is the necessary condition for the mind. It's also a proximally sufficient condition. It's only proximally sufficient because the brain is embedded in a nervous system, embedded in a body, embedded whoops, and embedded in culture, and both here and now and across time. So to talk about the brain as the, the brain is the local, the locally, it's the necessary condition and it's the locally sufficient condition for the mind. And as we'll see, the brain also depends on the mind. Now the way to understand the brain is really in a context of biological evolution. The you know, nervous system is about 600 million years old. As you know, life came on the planet about three and a half billion years ago. Multicelled creatures arose around 650 million years ago. And they were complicated enough to need some method of communication between their sensing organs and their motor systems around 600 million years ago, thus the beginning of the brain. Uh, in terms of vertebrates, it essentially evolved more or less in the way you see. This is kind of a schematic picture. Uh, you know, the inner reptile brain, and there's the squirrel monkey brain, and there's the early stone tool making hominid brain, the caveman brain, and the modern brain. The modern brain is essentially identical with the caveman brain. How many of you, by the way, have blue eyes or green eyes? Okay, you are mutants. In other words, until about 5,000 years ago, nobody had blue eyes. I mean, biological evolution is continuing. The first blue-eyed person was identified probably about 5,000 years ago, probably around Denmark. And then blue eyes have you know, proliferated around the world for various reasons. But evolution is continuing. All right. So in terms of that evolution, the brain developed three fundamental goal-directed systems. Or you could say they're motivational systems. This is why we do stuff. All right. The first system was the avoid system. Withdraw from threats. Freeze, back up. You know, get away. On top of that, then with roughly, you know, invertebrates, crustaceans, um, lizards, and so forth, and fish in the sea, uh, a, a more sophisticated approaching system developed to pursue opportunities. And then with birds and mammals, and then primates and particularly humans, the attached system developed. That's the social system in the brain that forms connections and bonds with us and seeks proximity, closeness, intimacy, love, and belonging. Although the vagus nerve, as it evolved, loosely maps to these three systems, they're anatomically blurred in their distinctions in the brain, and they intertwine with each other, and any single system can use two others for its ends. 
This typology, by the way, approach, avoid, attach, or avoid, approach, attach, is one we'll be returning to again and again. And it's a really useful way to think about um, how people are motivated and also think about how suffering and dysfunction and harm arise in terms of each one of those three systems. And also, on the other hand, how happiness, um, benevolence, and helpfulness arise in a different mode of um, action in each one of those three systems. All right. So love in the brain, it's interesting to realize, and this is what's called the social brain theory, that probably the primary driver of evolution of the brain in the last 100 million years has been social capabilities, or love broadly defined. For example, reptiles and fish approach and avoid, they don't attach, right? They have their babies, they swim away. If the babies are still there a few hours later, they'll eat them in most species. Whereas birds and mammals uh, do raise their young, and often form pair bonds, at least temporarily. Um, it's interesting that the brain developed in three major stages, driven really by the reproductive advantages, which is the engine of biological evolution uh, in, of social skills, if you will. Um, the first stage was with birds and mammals. They've got bigger brains per body weight than reptiles and fish do because the quote unquote computational requirements of raising young and picking a partner require a bigger brain. Similarly, at the next stage of development, there is a correlation between the size and complexity of the social group of a primate species and the size of the cerebral cortex in proportion to body weight. In other words, the grooming, the hierarchies, who's up, who's down, who's alpha, who's beta, how can I still get some if I'm beta, you know, the coalitions, and all the rest of that, right? You've got to have a pretty big brain. Um, all right. And then last, since the first hominids began making stone tools around two and a half million years ago, the brain has tripled in size. They were smart enough to make stone tools. I, how many here can make a stone tool? I can't make a stone tool. I don't know. But they could do it. Oh, well, you maybe could. That's good. Most people don't raise their hand when I ask them that question. That's a good one. Um, yet the build out of the brain uh, has been primarily devoted to social capacities. Language, cooperative planning, empathy, empathy the uh, presentation of self, uh, both authentically and with uh, artful deception and all the rest of that, has been much of what the volume of the brain, that's, as I said, tripled, the other two thirds, is devoted to. Interestingly, for uh, babies or humans to have a bigger brain, there's a kind of physical limit on how big the brain can be in um, a newborn and still enable its mother to walk upright. And so you start hitting a limit there. Most species, primate species, uh, there's basically a two to one ratio between the volume of the brain at birth and how big it eventually gets. The human brain, oh, it's probably about a fourfold, maybe even a fivefold increase. To do that, we needed a longer childhood. To have a longer childhood with a very vulnerable infant, you needed to develop bonds between mothers and infants and also bring fathers into the mix and also the band itself, you know, because it quote unquote takes a village to raise a child. And those uh, requirements um, helped drive the evolution of the social capabilities and inclinations that would enable that to occur, right. which then enabled bigger brains. And the advantages of those bigger brains you know, drove then increasing um, social capacities. And here we are today. All right. So three facts about the brain in terms of self-directed neuroplasticity. All right. <clears throat> so first fact about the brain. As the brain changes, the mind changes. All right, in good ways and bad. Left is a good slide, hopefully. Caffeine, sugar, pleasure. Right slide, a concussion. All right. The second fact about the brain is that as the mind changes, the brain changes. This is a critically important fact. In other words, immaterial mental activity, the movement of information through this hardware substrate, maps to material neural activity that produces temporary changes as well as lasting ones. Temporary changes include alterations in brain waves, uh, increased consumption of supplies like oxygen and glucose, ebbs and flows of neurochemicals like serotonin, dopamine, other neurotransmitters, and so forth. Now I'm going to show you some slides of uh, temporary fleeting changes in the structures of the brain uh, or brain activity that map to uh, mental activity. This is a slide of someone whose head's been kind of cut this way. And that's the caudate nucleus lit up because it's consuming more oxygen. It's a part of the brain that's involved in the reward center. And it activates in this particular study when college sophomores who are absolutely in love are shown a picture of their sweetheart. Male and female, they both get a major light up in the caudate nucleus. 
Right. I'm going to go through, by the way, a number of examples here. It's fascinating to get into some of the detail, but I'm going to keep us moving along. All right. Here's another slide that looks at um, envy and schadenfreude. This was a study done in Japan uh, with college students who were told about someone very much like them who was spectacularly more successful. And in the scanner, what arose inside them uh, were activations in the physical pain network. In other words, emotional pain, much as evolution. Evolution's a big kludge, essentially. It just uses lower systems and adapts them to you know, higher purposes. So social pain uses physical pain as a fundamental basis. Similarly, uh, social pleasure uh, uses physical pleasure systems. So in phase one, they told these students that there was this spectacularly wonderful person who made them really look horrible, right? Envy, physical pain. And then in phase two of the study, they were told that this person uh, encountered a humiliating downfall, schadenfreude, pleasure at the suffering of others. And the pleasure network was activated. Right, as you can see an example in this study. Here we go. Here's another one. This is self in the brain. We were talking about this uh, at lunch. These, in this study, basically, it's kind of hard to see maybe, but maybe not. The squares, the, the diamonds, and the crosses have to do with different activations of self-related activity in the brain. All right? For example, recognizing yourself in a photograph distinct from others, or naming a personal memory like what I did last summer, or making a difficult choice. What's interesting, <coughs> in this picture is to see how widely distributed self-related activations are throughout the brain. There's no part of the brain that's special for I, for me, for ego, for mine. It's widely distributed, which has some pretty profound implications. How about consciousness? The big magilla, right? Well, again, when a person is conscious or uh, is entering different kinds of consciousness, different parts of the brain are activated. And if you mess with those parts of the brain, uh, like uh, intersect at the linkages between the thalamus, which is a central relay station in the brain, and the cerebral cortex, you anesthetize somebody. All right? On the other hand, as consciousness changes or activates, uh, it uses different parts of the brain. Something as ineffable as awareness all right, alters or engages neural activity. Now let's talk about meditation. This is a slide. This is, this, in this shot, the head is cut this way, if you will of a Buddhist meditator doing compassion meditation. And the part of the brain that is activated there is called the anterior, which means frontal, cingulate cortex, which is a part of the brain that's involved in the executive control of attention, staying concentrated and attentive. Um, it also is uh, an area where the um, thinking and feeling are brought together as well. So it's interesting to realize that when this person is in the scanner doing a kind of spacious, infinite, you know, uh, boundless compassion meditation, uh, that this part of the brain is activated. Interestingly, this is a slide of Christian nuns in prayer who are doing a very different kind of spiritual activity, which activates some of the same region, ACC in the upper left-hand slide, left ACC, anterior cingulate cortex, it lights up because they're focusing their attention. But also, interestingly, they got activation in the insula, which is a part of the brain that tracks the interior sensations of the body, which suggests that for these nuns, who are women, of course, doing that particular practice, it had a very embodied quality, which kind of makes sense intuitively. And also they got an activation in the caudate nucleus. Again, it was very emotionally rewarding to bring to mind their most profound spiritual experience. In essence, now I'm going to talk about lasting changes in the brain, because those were all temporary, fleeting changes, mostly having to do with which part of the brain uses metabolic supplies. Mental activity shapes neural structure. It leaves lasting residues behind. This is the essence of what's called neuroplasticity. It does it in a variety of ways. I, lift, I listed some of the uh, mechanisms of action. Busy regions get more blood flow over time. Um, existing synapses get strengthened. You also get, interestingly, altered gene expression. That's epigenetics. In other words, ineffable mental activity can alter the um, expression of strips of atoms inside this long chain of DNA. Right? For example, people who routinely activate relaxation training uh, get improved gene expression 
of the uh, portions of DNA that downregulate the stress response. Isn't that kind of amazing? To think that you know, doing this long, deep breathing or going to one of Meng's classes is actually going to alter the expression of this strip of atoms inside some molecule somewhere. That just is pretty far out. Classically, there's a line uh, from the Canadian psychologist Donald Hebb, neurons that fire together wire together. In other words, when neural circuits or even individual neurons um, start associating with each other, the connections between them are strengthened. Uh, it, it, you know, okay? Great. So this has a number of implications. And I want to show you a slide here of some of the effects of this. Um, this was a study that was done on Buddhist meditators uh, taking a look at people in terms of years of practice and looking at changes in um, neural structure. Uh, <clears throat> in this particular study, they found that people um, who had a significant long-term practice, which has probably amounted to 20 to 40 minutes most days, you know, the real world of, of you know, Western practitioners, they actually had thicker cortical tissues in two key regions. One is the insula, that's number one, where they're tuning in to their body and their deep emotions and self-awareness in general. And also, area number two is the executive portions of the prefrontal cortex that have to do with controlling attention. The third region is the sensory motor strip where they were you know, tracking their body sensations. The interesting other finding is, in, is seen in the lower right-hand graph where the blue circles were compared to the red squares. Red squares are the control group. They experienced what's called cortical thinning with aging, normal cortical thinning. People lose probably, by the time they're 80, about you know, 3 to 5 percent of cortical mass. Uh, but the people who routinely used those regions, those are the blue circles, did not lose cortical tissue in those regions as a function of um, using it and not losing it. There are other examples. Some of them are quite you know, down to earth. I don't know if you've ever been to London. It's a spaghetti snarl of streets. Taxi cab drivers who have to memorize the streets of London have a thicker hippocampus at the end of their training than they did at the beginning. The hippocampus is a part of the brain that's involved in visual spatial memory. Uh, pianists who work routinely with certain kinds of um, movements have thicker you know, motor, motor cortices and the parts that control fine motor regions. In one study I read, it's very interesting, they took two groups of skilled pianists and they had them practice a certain kind of uh, song or piece that uh, involved certain specific motor movements. And then they divided the group, and they had one group do it like 10 minutes every day, and the other group just imagined doing it 10 minutes every day. And each group had roughly equivalent build out of neural structure. Isn't that like, wow. OK. So some perspectives here. Uh, Marvin Minsky, one of my favorites, you know, you're probably well known here, uh, probably a f godfather of cognitive science. Um, Society of Mind, a great book. Anyway, you can see here he's saying the principal activities of brains are making changes in themselves. I want to offer a bit of perspective on this, which is that, you know, neuroplasticity is not breaking news. It gets talked about a lot as if it's some new finding. No, it's been understood for 100 years or more that obviously mental activity had to change brain structure. What else is learning? The news is in the details. Most neuroplasticity is not dramatic. It's very, very incremental. Like, do you, can you remember what you had for breakfast or didn't have for breakfast this morning? That's neuroplasticity. You know, what's the capital of Nebraska, right? That's neuroplasticity. It's pretty humdrum. Uh, it's interesting, though, that even though neurons that fire together wire together uh, throughout the nervous system, the ones that really wire together do so in the field of awareness. That means that residues of conscious experience are continually sifting into neural structure. Implicit memory is mainly where they do this. This is not memory for specific events. That's explicit memory uh, for recollections. Uh, this is the internal felt sense of what it feels like to be me, um, action uh, dispositions, biases, emotional residues, and all the rest. The point of all this, really, the takeaway, for me there are half a dozen key takeaways, and this is one of them, is to really be a lot more thoughtful about what I experience moment to moment. Because whatever those neurons are doing, for better or worse, they're wiring together. You know, dwell in one's experience on themes of stress or tension or frustration or imminent failure or self-doubt and all the rest of that. Guess what? We're building neural structures of pessimism, depression, anxiety, lack of confidence, insecurity, inadequacy, self-criticism, etc. On the other hand, you know, rest experience and cultivate experiences 
that have a certain ease to them, a certain relaxation, never being more than 100 feet away from food, things like that, you know, that's going to cultivate neural structures that promote optimism, resilience, a positive mood, confidence, a willingness to reach high and take big risks. Right? Our experience really, really matters. Much of it is in the back. People don't really know what they're experiencing. Uh, that's why mindful self-awareness is so critical, or as Meng says, searching inside yourself. I'm really happy I was able to get that line in here. All right, so that's right. As I was saying earlier, most people are not very good at mindful attention. Attention is, you know, the preeminent way to build neural structure. It's like a combination spotlight and vacuum cleaner. You know, it illuminates what it rests upon and then <laughs> sucks it into the brain. But for most people, that spotlight and vacuum cleaner is very skittery. They can't rest it and keep it at some place where they want to keep it, or they can't move it very readily if they're getting sucked into obsessive ruminating, right? Just kind of going over and over and over again about some technical problem or some personally upsetting experience. That's why, as William James said, the father really of American psychology, the education of um, attention would be an education par excellence. So now what are we going to do with this mindful self-awareness, with the idea of self-directed neuroplasticity? It's the fundamental idea that we can use the mind to change the brain, to change the mind for the better. It was always understood that if people did mental activity A, they would get mental result C. And then it was increasingly understood during the last 100 years that somehow mental activity A produced mental result C via the black box B of the brain. But nobody knew how the black box worked. Increasingly, though, with these modern technologies that can peer inside the living, active brain non-invasively, um, we are now getting clearer and clearer about the circuitry, about the levers, the dials, the buttons, the dynamics inside the black box, so that it's increasingly possible to do reverse engineering. In other words, to identify what is the neural substrate in the black box of optimal states of functioning, happiness, relationship, uh, stress res relief, and all the rest of that, and then use mental activity alone, not medication, not you know, electroshock treatment, but mental activity alone to target those neural substrates and build them out in increasingly skillful ways. And that's the opportunity, and by the way, it's an historically unprecedented one. And the knowledge about the brain has essentially doubled in the last 20 years. I mean, we live in an historically extraordinary time for many reasons. This is certainly one of them. And it's also historically unprecedented in the coming together of those three circles, you know, that I talked about previously. Psychology, neurology, and contemplative practice. The contemplatives being the Olympic athletes of mental training for, you know, millennia. And so I'm really excited about this. You know, we're just at the beginning of it all. I think modern neuroscience is roughly where biology and medicine was about 100 years after the invention of the, of the microscope which is to say about 1720. Right? Where is it going to be in you know, 300 years? OK. So let's talk about some of the challenges now. What are we going to do with this uh, self-directed neuroplasticity? We've got to deal with the negativity bias. This is a really, really critically important slide. In other words, in our evolutionary history, we had to track carrots and sticks, right? Approach carrots, avoid sticks. That's really important. But for survival purposes, in very harsh, uh, uh, frequently lethal environments, um, sticks are more salient than carrots. In other words, if you miss a carrot today, you'll probably get a chance at one tomorrow. But if you fail to avoid a stick today, wow, no more carrots forever. So the brain responded, you know, because Mother Nature is a harsh teacher. Whatever confers reproductive advantages, that's what gets built out in the brain. So there are a number of ways this is done. I've listed just a few. For example, the amygdala, which is the alarm center of the brain, is primed to flag negative events. Probably about two-thirds or more of its cells are dedicated processors, if you will, for negative information or potentially negative information. And then the amygdala and the hippocampus, which are very close to each other. The hippocampus does visual spatial memory, but more broadly, it does memory for context rapidly flag anything that's remotely negative, store it, and retrieve it on a fast track, all right? The bottom line is that the brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones, unless it's a million dollar moment. So in effect, of those three systems, avoid, you know, approach, attach, the avoid system is very fast in that reptilian brain, if you will, and it routinely hijacks the approach and attach systems and puts them to its bidding. Uh, and therefore, as a result, in the title of a very famous paper, Bad is Stronger Than Good. By the way, um, 
I'm going to post these slides uh, on my website, and you'll be able to access them if you want. And at the end of them are a bunch of excellent books, as well as a number of papers and, a ref and the references for this presentation. Okay, so what are some examples of bad being stronger than good? Uh, in relationships, on the average, it takes about five positive interactions to even out a single negative one. All right. What's the history of the last three days in your intimate relationships, you know, with family members, lovers, or children, right? It's, it's quite cautionary to think about that. Uh, or alternately, people will do much more to avoid losing a loss than um, getting an equivalent gain. In other words, people will work harder or they'll put up with more electrical shock to avoid losing 100 bucks you gave them in an experiment than they'll work hard to get 100 bucks you put on the table that they got to fight for, it, right? Or last, it's really easy to make people feel helpless. In dog studies, for example, who have a limbic system, an emotional system very much like our own, you can train a dog in helplessness in about five trials. You know, five cycles where bad things happen that they have zero control over, roughly, you can train them in helplessness. And then it takes dozens, even 100 or more trials, to untrain them. And the parallels for human beings are much the same. That's why I think it's really important to pay a lot of attention to feeling um, helpless and uh, a sense of futility and to work really hard to not feel that way and if nothing else redefine the game into one you can actually win at where you actually do have efficacy. <clears throat> now on the, this nat question naturally arises here, yeah but isn't there some good with negative experiences? Well sure, okay. Remorse keeps us kind of on the path of virtue, sorrow opens the heart, um, negative experiences can increase resilience and all the rest. But walk down downtown or walk around this campus, um, which is a, you know, a pretty rarefied environment. Look at faces. Look at my face. You can see the suffering in faces. You know, is there any shortage of negative experiences in the world? Is anyone here, would you like more negative experiences? We could give you some of ours. Any volunteers? I've never had a volunteer yet you know, who'd like more negative experiences. All right. So what are we going to do about this? Now, negative experiences, it's important to realize, have significant mental and physical health consequences. I'll just zip through this slide. I won't get into the detail of it, but chronic stress is one of the main results because when we're upset, our stress response systems are activated. All right? Getting angry, even just irritated, getting nervous about something, feeling depressed, feeling ashamed or inadequate or you know, alarmed in any way, shape, or form triggers the fight-flight uh, response systems through the sympathetic nervous system. And HPAA stands for hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access, the endocrine system, in other words, because the nervous system and the endocrine system work together in terms of stress response. It's pernicious. Chronic stress is the enemy, particularly for people who are interested in living past 35. In other words, unlike our great-great-grandparents in the caveman days, you know, most of us want to live past, you know, 35. What kind of life are we going to have? The slowly accumulating impacts of chronic stress were pretty irrelevant on the Serengeti three, five, one million years ago, but they're very relevant today in modern times. Okay. So how would you like to do something experiential? for a minute or two, you know, get out of this head stuff for a second. So now that I've given you the bad news, and I'm going to give you more bad news in a minute, I want to talk about self-compassion for a moment. This is a hot area of research. A lot of the benefits of self-esteem actually boil down to self-compassion. Arguably, self-compassion is more powerful, partly because it's so emotional. Self-compassion is not self-pity. It's not wallowing. It's taking a moment, and it's usually, you know, typically less than 10 seconds, to just have a sense of, ow, that hurts. This sucks. That doesn't feel good. I wish it was better. Ew. Pause, then suck it up and move on, right? But first do that self-compassion phase. If people just suck it up and move on without having done self-compassion first, they haven't fueled themselves in a deep way. Now, self-compassion is actually quite hard for many people. So as a little example of this reverse engineering idea I talked about earlier, I've thought through what are things that activate the neural substrates of compassion um, so that people can do self-compassion who may find it difficult. And that's in those three bullets right there. So I'll do it right now. This is private. You don't have to do it. All right? You can think about anything else. You could even really get involved in self-criticism and self-loathing. But, you know, that's really up to you. Okay. So first step. Bring to mind a sense of being cared about by somebody. Could be a pet, a grandparent, someone in your life today, a spirit entity, a group of people, 
just the felt sense. What's it feel like to feel cared about? All right, second, and you can go at your own pace or not do this at all. Um, bring to mind also someone that you naturally feel compassion for. In other words, you naturally wish that they not suffer. And you have an attitude of tender concern. Maybe a child, a dear friend, relative, a group of people, starving refugees somewhere, whatever. Third step, this is a mindfulness practice now, sink into the experience of compassion in your body. What's it feel like? Stay present with it. And then come from that embodied felt sense of compassion to yourself with a sense of the ways in which life is hard. It's not perfect. You might combine it with some verbal inner language like, you know, may I feel better? May I feel better about this thing? May it go better for me with that, you know, man or woman in my life? You know, may I not suffer? Okay, great. I guarantee you, if you did it, you lit up neural circuits of self-compassion. And every time you do this, it, it doesn't build much structure, but it builds a little bit of structure. And if you do it routinely, over time, those neurons fire together, therefore they wire together, and you're building the neural substrates of self-compassion. All right. So now let's get into some more bad news. And I want to talk here about threat reactivity and paper tiger paranoia. If you think about it, there are two major mistakes we can make in life. We, on the one hand, we can think there is a tiger in the bushes when there isn't one. Okay. On the other hand, we can think there's no tiger in the bushes and it's all fine, but there really is one about to pounce. Now, we evolved to make the first mistake 100 times, 10,000 times, to avoid making the second mistake even once, because that's how you stop having gene copies. All right? This evolutionary tendency, which is deeply ingrained in people to be threat reactive, is then intensified by temperament. Some people are more anxious than others. Then life happens, personal history. Then you have culture. And then you have uh, political manipulation. It's a classic story, obviously, throughout human history to uh, build up a sense of external threat or even internal threat, and on the basis of that, get more compliance from the populace. I mean, that story has been told a 1,000 times or more in human history. This threat reactivity happens at the individual level, happens inside me, happens inside you, it happens between people, like in a relationship within a family, happens at the level of organizations. It's interesting to think about how that may or may not be happening at Google and how you've taken wise steps here to um, stop it from happening. And it obviously happens at the national level and the international level, the level between nations and the world altogether. This has a lot of implications, really, if you think about the current moment in world history. What are some of the results of this threat reactivity, um, both at the individual, organizational, and national level? First, initial appraisals are mistaken. There's a tendency to overestimate threats, underestimate opportunities, and underestimate resources, either for coping with threats or for capturing opportunities. Um, we tend to update these appraisals with information that selectively confirms them, and we tend to, through what's the mechanisms of what's called cognitive dissonance, we tend to ignore, devalue, or alter information that doesn't fit these pictures. Thus, we end up with views of ourselves other people and the world and the future and the past that are ignorant, selective, and distorted. Any comments or questions so far? That's the bad news. Now the good news. Actually, there's more bad news. I apologize. <laughs> I turned the page too quickly. My mistake. I was eager to get on. So I thought to myself, you know, what's a short list and one slide of the major costs of threat reactivity? You could probably add a few items to this list with a little thought. For one, feeling threatened feels bad. As soon as we feel threatened, activates the stress response system. We start getting stress hormones. Uh, you know, we start focusing around the threat uh, and with all the consequences I talked about before. Feeling overthreatened makes people overinvest in threat protection and not invest in things like uh, raising kids or schooling 
or building infrastructure or you know, taking long, making long-term plans. Then you've got the story of the boy who cried tiger. In other words, if people feel flooded with threats that are actually not real or, or are overstated or are easily managed by one thing or another, it's easy to miss the needle in the haystack of the actual threat that's really important to think about. I think that's one of the things that's happened with things like global warming. People are so caught up in you know, this endless list of you know, murders on the evening news and you know, a sense of global threat all, all around us and that they miss long-term things that are actually going to be very consequential. If we act when we're threatened, we tend to overreact. That creates uh, cycles in which other people feel threatened and confirm our worst fears. The approach system gets inhibited when people feel threatened, when the avoid system activates. So we tend to not pursue opportunities or we play small, lose our nerve, or give up too quickly. And then the approach system is, pardon me, the attach system is put in the service of threats. Uh, people tend to really bond with us. They increase their sense of fear and anger toward them. And they put up with more mistreatment within us, you know, to protect me, protect me, you know, strong father figure, if you will. Uh, you know, from them out there about to get me. <laughs> Obviously, threat reactivity, and you can think of it on the global scale, or even inside this country, red state, blue state, or uh, even more locally in terms of different groups of us's and them's, <coughs> threat reactivity is a major source of prejudice, oppression, and war. And if we want to make this world a better place, helping people see through paper tiger paranoia is a fundamentally profound and powerful way to do that. And my little hope is that Google will in some ways you know, help that happen. So now let's talk about the optimal brain. Let's talk about how to deal with this kind of paper tiger paranoia. And these, by the way, are practices and tools you can use in your own personal life. And I'm going to talk about them. So think about reverse engineering. What's the state of the brain in peak performance modes, peak productivity, or in a state of, let's say, self-actualization, or enlightenment even, or close to it? Clearly, there have been many people throughout human history that have been in these states, many of us in this room. Probably everybody in this room has gotten into that zone um, at one time or another. What in the world could be happening in the brain you know, when a person is in that zone? Well, the home base of the human brain which, alas, we are so, so easily driven from, is characterized by a calm the four C's, calm, contented, caring, and creative. And you can see how calm, contented, and caring map to the um, three systems, right? Avoid, approach, and attach, and creative, generative. People are generative. Obviously, it's extraordinarily generative here. Um, people are generative in particular when they go into the zone of calm, contented, and caring. This is the brain in its natural, let's call it a responsive mode. It's not offline. It's not anesthetized. It's engaged in the world. It's embodied and it's inactive. It's continually leaning forward into the future, but it does so in a particular mode of operation. To look at it in a schematic, you can see this triangle here in which the three systems, and by the way, I, this graphic comes from a little earlier form of this material in which I called the attached system uh, affiliation system. Um, it can see the way in which the brain operates, your brain, my brain operates, our brains operate when we're in this natural state. The problem, though, is that to survive, we leave home. In other words, on a hair trigger, Mother Nature has given us the capability of activating any one of these three systems, or all three of them in concert, in a different kind of mode. Call it a reactive mode that then drives us from home. It's a kind of inner homelessness. In other words, when people feel threatened or harm, they're in the reactive mode. When they can't attain important goals, they're frustrated or disappointed, reactive mode. When they feel isolated, abandoned, devalued, they're not getting the healthy, normal, narcissistic supplies they need. When they feel left out, dissed, shunned, and so forth, that also triggers this reactive mode. And it, too, has a number of consequences. So here's a little slide that summarizes it. All right. So those are the choices, really. Reactive mode, which is the ordinary experience. Look at the front page. It's all reactive mode. Watch the evening news, mostly reactive mode. A lot of life. Think about a, uh, you know, dealing with some issue with an intimate, a friend, a partner, a family member. You know, as they say in the spiritual biz, think you're enlightened? Go visit your parents for the holidays. 
right? You know, what's it like in the real world? What's it like in traffic when someone flips you off? You know, what's it like when you're the person you like least as a political figure is yapping away on the evening news, right? What happens then? I mean, we easily get triggered into this reactive mode. So now, what to do about it? How to come home? How to recover the fundamental, natural, responsive mode of the brain right in the middle of the trenches, not in a cave in Tibet, not in a monastery, but in daily life, one step at a time, one breath at a time. As the Tibetans say, if you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. So how can each one of us take care of the minutes in our own life or help others take care of the minutes in their lives so that the, year, so that the years will get better and better for this planet? Well, first I want to talk about three fundamental uh, pillars of practice that show up in contemplative traditions as well as in Western psychology, um, mindfulness, virtue, and wisdom. And by um, different terms, you see these again and again and again. And I think that's because they map to three central functions, arguably the three central functions of the nervous system, which is to say receiving and learning, okay, regulating and prioritizing which map very closely to mindfulness, virtue, and wisdom, and which also map to the three fundamental phases of any kind of personal growth or emotional healing, which is to say, open up to it, experience it, be with it, be mindful of it. Second phase, at the just right moment, help it move along, release that negative stuff. And then third phase, when there's a space there, replace it with something better or in six words, let be, let go, let in. And the reason I think that these um, fundamental pillars of practice are found again and again, including in traditions that were certainly pre-technical, is because they map so closely to the universal human nervous system. As a takeaway point at the bottom, mindfulness is vital, but it's not enough. Mindfulness needs to be matched with virtue, with values, and with wisdom, some fundamental understanding. Somebody wants to find wisdom of as giving up a lesser pleasure for a greater one. I mean, it's that clarity about what is the greater good here that I'm going to sacrifice this lesser pleasure for. I mean, that's, that's wisdom. Additionally, I want to talk, there's some general factors for the responsive mode that I just want to call to your attention here. If you want to drop your brain into its natural state of calm, contented, caring, and creative, Self-compassion, getting on your own side. So many people are not on their own side. You know, in other words, they're not for themselves. It's so interesting to think about it. That's a critical mo moment to actually say, no, how it feels to be me matters. My brain matters over time. I'm going to be for myself. I'm going to try to do little things every day that will build a better brain or other aspects of my life gradually over time. Mindful self-awareness I've talked about seeing the world clearly. I think Google has helped enormously here and it can continue to help uh, in the future, particularly uh, by appreciating the depth of threat reactivity, the depth of the paranoid trance and the insidiousness of it. Um, taking life less personally, appreciating increasingly that it's not really about me. And one particular practice, which is a chapter in my book, Buddha's Brain, and will probably be um, very central to the uh, book I write after the one I'm writing now, um, is taking in the good. And so if we could, I'd like to do a little practice here with you about taking in the good. Because if you think about it continually, the brain is taking in the bad. Remember? It's like Velcro for negative experiences, Teflon for positive ones. It has dedicated systems that just suck any kind of negative information into the brain. Think about 100 things happen in the course of a day, right? 70 are pretty good, you know, 28 are neutral, two are kind of sucky. What are the ones you think about as you fall asleep? Usually it's the stuff that was a drag, right? And that's the brain. It just wants to grab hold of that. That's why using mindful awareness for about 20, 30 seconds in a row can actually build out neural structure in a much more positive way. So if you'd like, let's do it together. And you don't have to do it, but let's give it a crack. So first off, first step, pick a positive fact. It could be, you know, I, I particularly like picking a positive fact about a good quality inside yourself. All right, wherever you go, there you are, right? Or you could think about a good condition in the world or a good event recently. Someone was nice to you, some good thing happened. And then let yourself really feel it. All kinds of good facts occur, but we don't register them. They don't move the needle. But in this case, we're helping ourselves because we're on our own side to let ourselves feel good. It's a private act. No one needs to know you're doing it. There are lots of taboos about feeling good, feeling happy. You can hide it behind your face. But let yourself feel good. 
and then in particular in the second step, savor it for 15, 20, 30 seconds in a row. Stay with feeling good for a quarter of a minute. And as you do it, sense and intend that this good experience is gradually sifting down into you. It's sinking in and even perhaps filling the hole in your heart, gradually soothing, even replacing perhaps old places of pain. Or at a minimum, simply being a moment of good experience. And that's it. Now, any single time you do this won't make much difference. Half a dozen times a day, continually looking for opportunities to take in the good, to make your brain like Velcro for positive experiences, will make it like Teflon for negative ones. And over time, everyone I've ever worked with who's done this, within a week or two, people start feeling different. Within a few weeks and certainly a few months, quite radically different. This is also a fantastic method for children particularly kids at either the spirited or anxious, rigid, you know, ends of the temperamental spectrum. You know, jackrabbits and turtles, right? They're all normal. There's no disorder there in jackrabbititis. It's a normal temperamental variation, but it's tough to be a jackrabbit in a turtle culture in some ways, certainly in turtle schools. So anyway, taking in the good for a few moments just before bed is a great way to fill the heart of kids. And I'll use metaphors with them like putting a jewel in their heart and so forth. All right. It naturally comes up, of course, why do this? Which interest is an interesting question, like what a taboo right there on feeling good. Uh, benefits of positive emotions are kind of a proxy for the benefits of taking in the good. There's a lot of research on positive emotions. I'll just leave that slide there for a moment. But positive emotions, wow, have fantastic benefits. Happiness really is skillful means. Um, if you take a look at my website, uh, wisebrain.org, you'll see the slide sets for a number of talks. And one of the nice things about positive emotions is they steady the mind, because they do it in various ways having to do with dopamine and working memory. But it's a great way to support concentration uh, and productivity to encourage positive emotion. Also it comes up, you know, whether it's selfish to feel happy. And I think Bertrand Russell had a fantastic line here. He pointed out that as he conceived of it, right, the good life is a happy one because happy people are good people. And there's a lot of research that shows that, with some significant exceptions, people who have basic well-being, who already have a sense of overflowingness inside themselves, are more inclined to offer benefit to other people. So from the standpoint, obviously, of you know, productivity and reducing turnover and anything like that, whether it's at Google or any company in the world, helping uh, people feel happy at work is a great way to promote productivity and you know, generosity and teamwork and team building with other people. All right, moving to an end here and then hoping to have a few more minutes for questions and discussion at the end. I also took a look at specific factors that are, may not be so obvious for activating the responsive mode of the brain for each one of these three fundamental systems. In the approach system, for example, focusing on gladness and gratitude, uh, fantastic. People do things like the three blessings exercise at the end of the day. They just list three things to be grateful for, take half a minute to focus on them. That has had amazing results for such a simple intervention. Um, and giving oneself over to one's best purposes is another way to activate the approach system in a context of prior uh, contentment and wisdom. The affiliating system, what I want to call out there is the last one, the idea of acting with unilateral virtue. In other words, living by your own code of integrity and good conduct, regardless of what the other person does. In other words, not getting involved in this kind of you know, Mexican standoff. I do couples counseling as well as other things, where people basically say, I'll treat you well if you treat me well. You go first, right? And we know where that really gets us. On the other hand, if you act with unilateral virtue, it makes you feel good right off the top. Um, it also gives you a sense of initiative, and it puts you on the high moral ground so that after a few days or weeks even, you can then say very rightfully to the other person, I stopped being a jerk. I'm giving you what you want. I'm lining off your reasonable complaints. All right, how about me? Okay? And then last, with regard to the avoid system, calming the body in general. As soon as we get activated in the stress response system, we're primed to go negative because those systems are disposed and lean toward negative responsiveness. So activating a calming, soothing response whenever we feel stressed or upset is a good basic default. And then I would say last, tolerate risking the dreaded experience. We live small. 
We live in a way to avoid experiences we dread. And then that becomes the new normal, and after a while, we start to forget about it. It's a little bit like these tigers that are in cages. Speaking of tigers, they remove the cage because they built a park around them, but the tiger will not cross the line that's written, you know, that's painted there on the cement because they still live within that box. They still presume that limitation. The trick is to risk the dreaded experience instead of avoiding it. In other words, um, put one's neck out in a meeting. Tell someone you love them. Um, open up to some feelings and see that it goes well, which it usually does. Okay? In effect, this is, in the traditional phrase, taking the fruit as the path. In other words, taking the end as the means. Taking the end of calm, contentment, and caring, or here in this, you know, I reordered it, gladness, uh, love, and peace, taking that as the method as well as the destination. Uh, in, for example, literally I found myself increasingly, I just named these three words to myself. I did before I came down here to do this talk, which was making me nervous. I said, Rick, gladness, love, peace, okay, good, in the zone, okay, good place, right? Whatever works for you to get in your zone. Different things work for different people. All the great teachers have offered huge toolboxes with a diversity of tools. Neurological diversity is the most critically important and fundamental and substantive kind of diversity there really is. And so um, that's why I think it's really important to find one's own way. That gives us a fundamental choice, right? Reactive mode, which is the ordinary lot characterized by suffering, ignorance, and harm or the responsive mode, the natural state of the brain, which can see through paper tiger paranoia uh, and can be gradually cultivated with self-directed neuroplasticity. And that's the opportunity for us all today. It's historically unprecedented. It's grounded in science. Papers are coming out every day, basically, with new opportunities to figure out how to reverse engineer the brain. And each one of us can do this in our own lives with benefits that ripple throughout the entire planet. So I thank you for your attention. It's a great privilege to be here. Thank you, thank you very much. Question or comment for the last minute? One, or one? yes, no? A question about, oh. uh, I, I've heard that uh, a number of traditions anyway say that if you're trying to make a change in your consciousness, when a point comes, the point comes when you can actually make a shift there will be a, an opposite, there will be a, a resistance, there will be like a, a pull from where you came from that will try to keep the status quo. How does that, is that, is that known as an actual, something that happens in the brain that tries to keep us in our, in our previously more contracted consciousness? I think that's true in two ways and wonderfully untrue in a third, all right? First, uh, the brain is a giant association network. Everything's connected to everything else. So if we have a breakthrough over here, we still have that old learning over there. People say to me sometimes, I feel guilty that I'm still upset about my childhood, right? Well, of course you are. You know, the brain learned. It's designed to learn, and that learning persists until it gradually is replaced or overcome. First. Second, it's very interesting how the brain is organized. It's very much uh, basically yin and yang, in effect, um, stop and go. Um, you know, inhibit or fire. That's the way the brain is organized. And I think a lot of uh, knowledge structures in the brain are organized around uh, figure and ground or something in its, you know, thesis, antithesis, in effect. So when you break through in one area or you think about something, very often the opposite comes up. For example, think about something that makes you feel proud of yourself. Pause. Very often something will come up that's associated with self-doubt. So, so what you're saying, I think, is natural. That said, very often people will have a breakthrough and they get a release. They're done with it. They saw through it, they changed, they got it. I love the line from practice, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening. So very often what we have is we have awakenings, we have insights, we realize something, then we've got to cultivate around it. We've got to backfill, we've got to build an infrastructure which then enables the next awakening, the next insight, the next breakthrough, the next release, to be even deeper. But something I've really come to see, honestly, I've been a therapist a long time. It's made me more compassionate, but it's made me tough as nails, in this sense that most people will not do the work. But if you do the work, the sky's the limit in the changes you can make in your mind, your brain, and your life, and in this world. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.